Uh, it's almost afternoon. I guess I can say good morning for another minute and a half or so, so good morning. Um, <clears throat> educators, colleagues, and our guests, dignitaries, members of the media, I'm grateful for being given the opportunity to talk today uh, about one of my passions, uh, the intersection, I guess, of two of my passions, cybersecurity and education. Um, I do realize that I'm probably the only thing standing between you and lunch right now, so I'll try to keep it relatively quick. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so bef before I start, though, uh, just a couple of quick anecdotes. So, my, uh, so why am I here? Um, my father was a U.S. Marine for 30 years. Uh, when I grew up, I, I thought I was going to follow in his footsteps, uh, join the Marine Corps. Uh, turns out I have um, a, a congenital issue with my lungs, which kind of disqualified me from joining the military. Uh, so I, I, was, I spent quite a bit of time in my youth searching for a different way I can, I can contribute to um, the same sorts of ideals, right? Um, protecting the weak, the vulnerable, um, helping to 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 you know raise society, um, and I can't repeat um, as eloquently as Mark did earlier about the mission of education, but that that's kind of what I fell into, right? That this passion I have, and and now that I'm you know a little bit older, I have kids of my own. Um, it just it just means that much more to me. So. Um, a couple of the things that were said earlier today. Um, Mr. Robinson from Jamaica College, I think, mentioned how helpful uh, facts Renwa was during COVID. Uh, I'm going to share a quote from UNESCO a little bit later that's going to kind of tie into that. And from Mr. Harris's presentation, um, you know, it was uh, he talked about leveraging technology. Uh, he talked about the expectations of the provider. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit here from in the context of cybersecurity. And then uh, also from Senator Crawford's uh, speech, he talked a little bit about let's make sure we're not the lowest hanging fruit in terms of being a targeted um, industry or, or targeted institution. So I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, all right, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. So uh, I think seven or eight slides I'm going to go through here. The first one I'm going to talk about is, is a level set. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be providing some data. Uh, to you, uh, not data that you need to walk out memorizing, but just um, you know data that would be helpful for you to know, as well as some sources you can use to go get some of that data on your own. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of cybersecurity events that happened uh, in 2022 in the education space. Uh, talk about uh, bring back to some of the data. Talk about some trends uh, to look for for 2023, specifically within the intersection of cybersecurity and education. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about data protection and regulations. Although full disclosure, I'm not an attorney. That you know, I'm not going to provide legal advice. I see a banner over there for an attorney, so uh, probably somebody more qualified than me can answer some of those questions. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, we'll talk a little bit specifically about the uh, Jamaican Data Protection Act 2020. I'll provide some practical advice, and, and I want to make sure I, I emphasize this, right? Uh, and I'll talk about this more. There are there are many things that we can do um, that are relatively inexpensive and relatively simple to make sure that we don't end up being the, the lowest hanging fruit or the target of opportunity. And I'll talk a little bit about the silver lining. So why do I call it the silver lining? Well. I talk a lot about cybersecurity, and sometimes people kind of walk away thinking, wow, that's kind of scary. I don't really know what to do. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe the use of technology or, or this digital, you know, digital transformation is not the best thing for me. I want to make sure nobody walks away thinking that today. I want to talk about the silver lining here. And uh, lastly, um, I'll, just, I'll just leave up uh, some additional information, some online resources that you can go to, specifically for education on things that we can do to help protect the data that we have. Okay, so level set. So first thing here, so th this is just a picture of a spreadsheet that I made based on the Verizon data breach investigation report. Uh, Verizon Business releases this report every year, and it goes uh, industry by industry or sector by sector uh, worldwide, but obviously with, with a U.S. focus because that's where a lot of the data comes from. <clears throat> and what we can see here is that the, the education industry it's not in the top five, right? But it's not at the bottom either in terms of um, publicly available data about uh, data breaches. So what I'd like you to walk away with here is, to, you know, we're definitely not the lowest hanging fruit. We're not, you know, in the top five, but we're high enough that we really should be thinking thoughtfully and seriously 
about how to protect the, the information of our students and our staff and our teachers and our families. And second here, a couple of things you can take away from this graphic. And in, 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 uh, the first gra the first comes from, as I said, the Verizon report. The second comes from an organization called K-12-6, which I'll be talking about. <clears throat> uh, a couple of things to take away here is one, you know, the, probably the first thing you see is like, you know, the graph getting bigger, right? That's not necessarily, don't take that to mean that the problem is getting worse. You know, although, you know, that may or may not be the case. There's really just more information today. Every single year, every single um, techno technological advancement, we're able to get more of this information. But what I really want you to take away from here is, if you look at sort of how the, how the colors are separated here, data breaches and ransomware are the top two threats that education, educational institutions, educational technology companies, schools face. So that's kind of the focus of what I'll be talking about today. Okay, so 2022, looking back. So I have three examples here, uh, each one with the lessons learned. Uh, the first example is the Dallas Independent School District uh, had a cyber breach in 2022. It turned out to be two students um, who had actually caused it and taken complete control of the school district systems. Uh, the lesson learned here, though, is apparently some consultants had notified the school district about some specific vulnerabilities they had in their IT systems a year and a half prior. Um, the school district hadn't done anything about them, apparently, and the students were able to exploit it. So the lesson learned here is, um, and I saw this in my consulting career so many times, right? If we have information about a weakness in our systems, it really has to go into that funnel of, of stuff we need to do, right? And it needs to be prioritized along with everything else uh, versus just kind of saying we, ha we haven't had a problem yet, we probably won't have one in the future, right? That's, that's not gonna work anymore. Second one here, this one actually affected uh, my family personally. Uh, the Chicago Public School System relied on a third party vendor called uh, Battelle for Kids. Uh, this vendor was a teacher evaluation software as, as well as some other uh, services that they provided. And this vendor uh, experienced a ransomware attack and some of that information was actually taken from the school, right? And then um, apparently uh, potentially released online. <clears throat> so the, the lesson learned there, right? Um, we heard earlier about making sure we have the expectations of our vendors in mind when we rely on them for storing, processing, or transmitting our personal information. <clears throat> and the third one here, so this is a reminder of not just protecting the confidentiality of personal information. Uh, the Green Valley School District uh, experienced a cyber attack where their systems were just taken offline. They experienced a denial of service. No information was stolen, no ransomware infected them, but they, they were so dependent on like, you know, their, their computer network at school that once that system went offline, they didn't, they didn't really know what to do, right? So it's not just the confidentiality of data we need to worry about, it's also the availability of our computer systems, which is one of the strengths of, of the cloud, as an example. So 2023, looking forward, this is gonna be more data. Um, and again, uh, this is from a combination of the Verizon uh, Data Breach Investigation Report as well as K-12-6. Uh, the first one you see here, it, you'll see kind of some squiggly lines there, right? That, that's because of the way that the data is measured. Um, the, the blue squiggly lines are sort of all industries except for education. Uh, the green is education. You can kind of see where they, where they kind of match and where they kind of diverge. Now these three types of incidents, there's system intrusion, miscellaneous errors, and basic web application attacks, these account for more than 80% of the cybersecurity incidents in the education space. So if we can focus on these three areas, we can potentially prevent a number of incidents. <clears throat> and uh, so miscellaneous errors, actually, just one thing I want to say about that. So what that means, that's sort of like a, it's a catch-all for the accidental uh, breaches as well, right? It also includes things like accidentally emailing um, data about one student to, to another parent, right? That sort of thing. So that's where the, the security awareness mindset that I'll be talking about in a minute is going to come into play. And the, the, the graphic on the right here kind of shows the, uh, the, the types of individuals, uh, their motives, and the type of data that they compromise. And you'll see in the bottom one, it doesn't add up to 100%. That's because many data breaches kind of have multiple 
uh, aspects to them, right? <clears throat> so it's not just personal information, it's uh, credentials, those are things like passwords, which, you know, if you're using the same password at school that you are for your personal email, that sort of thing, right? Uh, you can see how that sort of information can be useful to the bad guys. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna go very light over this area because I, I think we're gonna be talking about this a little bit later as well. So there are some regulations um, kind of worldwide that are, that are beginning to, to, to come to the forefront. In the United States, so FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, that's been around for a long time, right? 1974, before the internet. Um, in, in the US, the K-12 Cybersecurity Act of 21, 2021 came out, um, but it's, it's very light, right? What it does is it mandates the cyber, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency to just create voluntary guidelines for schools, right? It's, it's, it's kind of weak. So in, in the US, we have states coming out with all these different, sometimes contradicting regulations, not, not really the best, uh, the, the best way to do it. Now in the EU and in Jamaica, right? In the EU we have GDPR, in Jamaica we have the Data Protection Act. Um, I'm not saying this just because of, of the audience, right? But I've read the Data Protection Act. I like it. It's, it's common sense. It, I'll talk about this a little bit on the next slide. Uh, it gives us some specific definitions to work with. And it's something that we can, we can make sure that we are uh, doing island-wide or nationwide, right? It's not something that we have we have like one set of rules here, we have one set of rules over on the northwest side, right? So that's, that's very nice. And then the right hand side, and I'll include some links to these at the very end, uh, but you can, you can Google it too. Uh, the Center for Internet Security. So the Center for Internet Security is for some more technical, crunchy, like what do I do for this particular system? Like this is something for your, your technical teams, your, your IT people. This is a resource they should know. Uh, this is a free resource for the most part, right? There are things you can pay for uh, that, that give you specific information on how to specifically secure your system, like your, your Apple laptop, right? Or your Windows computer, that sort of thing. Uh, there's another organization, K-12-6, stands for Security Information Exchange. I highly recommend anybody involved in the education space, check out their website. So they're, they're, they're based in the US, but they have an international focus about just protecting the information of one of our most vulnerable populations, right? Our kids. Um, they, they released uh, free reports and free guidance uh, to school districts and to schools and other educational institutions. Uh, what to do if you, like you see a cybersecurity incident response run book, right? That's what to do if you're under a ransomware attack. Um, it's a, a district self-assessment tool or a school self-assessment tool. If you can get a good picture of what the security posture is of your school, do you have any glaring weaknesses uh, that you should think about? And uh, you know, specifically on the US center side, there is a state and local cybersecurity grant program. It's not very heavily used, I think, in the education space because schools can't apply for it themselves. It has to be granted to them by the state. So again, I, I like the Data Protection Act for, for two main reasons. The first one is it gives us key terms and it gives us a good definition of what those key terms are. Uh, the second is it, it gives us like some very clear standards, right? I did expand the specific security control section because I come from a really technical background. That's kind of the area that I, I naturally gravitate to. Um, and, and again, right, it, it kind of covers not just the cybersecurity, but the privacy aspect and the, the responsible and the ethical disclosure and use of information sort of aspect, kind of similar to, to GDPR, which, which I think is great. And then one last thing here, one last caveat here is, and I've seen this many, many times, especially in the consulting world, is that there's a, there's a, a very common misconception. If we're using a vendor or a service provider or a platform that manages everything for us, we're, we're compliant, right? We can, we can, like we're done with it, right? There's nothing we have to do. Uh, and that, that couldn't be farther from the truth, right? It's, it's, it's one thing to say, that we're using this, you know, the student information system that's managing all of our data, but you have to put data into that system and you get data out of that system. That means there are things that you still need to do, right? You can, you can, uh, you can rely on that system um, to take care of everything that they are responsible for, but that's not the totality, right, 
of the information lifecycle within your institution. So some, some practical advice here. And again, I'm gonna rely on some third-party resources here. So this might be a little bit difficult for you to see, but you can get this from the K-12-6 website, which I'll provide in a, in a bit. Right, this is four categories, 12 security controls at a high level, at a non-technical level, right, in terms of, of explanation, that schools and at other educational institutions should be thinking of this year, 2022-2023 school year. Um, these sets of, these controls are things that K-12-6 um, updates for every upcoming school year based on data from prior years and trends that they're seeing for the next year. So this is tailored to the education industry. Things like um, blocking malicious websites, uh, not just from students, also from uh, faculty, administrators, that sort of thing. Uh, defending against email attacks, uh, restricting administrative access. Uh, simple things like having your, your antivirus software, right? Um, planning for cyber incidents. I mentioned that cybersecurity runbook as an example. All right, and then there are two other concepts that I want to talk about here. One is securing the human. So in, in, in information security and in cybersecurity, there's, you know, one of the things we like to say is humans can be the strongest or the weakest link in the chain. Um, so when we talk about securing the human, we want to make sure that, that us, people, the, the ones using the computer systems are the strongest link in that chain. So what I mean by that are two main things, right? One is the organizational culture. Um, and it starts at the top, right? Uh, the, the, the top echelon of the administration has to care and has to, has, to, has to visibly care, right, about the culture that we're setting in terms of making sure that we're protecting the information on our systems. Um, back when I first started in uh, cybersecurity, long, long time ago, uh, I remember working for, a, for a, a call center company where we had just started using ID badges uh, to get in and out of doors, uh, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and one of the things that, that's kind of stopped us from building that, that level of organizational security was that uh, the executives at the company, they, they didn't want to do that, right? It's just a hassle. Um, so making sure that it starts at the top and that it's something that you know we as leaders we we're 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 visible and we're vocal about wanting to protect the information that that really helps. Uh, the second is data minimization. So it, it's very simple, right? Uh, oftentimes we take things for granted. This is the way we've always done it, right? Uh, why should we change? But what we really need to do is take a look at the information we get from our students, from our parents, and the information we generate within the institution. Do we really need it? Like, do, do we need to have like the TRN number for this specific process? Maybe, maybe not, right? If we do need it, let's just make sure where we talk about the things like, like the access control, right, that people were talking about earlier, that, which you can easily do in RenWeb. And then the last one is get rid of it as soon as you don't need it. Um, if you th look at many of the, at least the, the public data breaches, um, a lot of that involves information that was old. Information that, sure, maybe it was recent information, but part of that data dump included information from three, four, five, six, ten years ago. Information that that organization probably didn't need anymore. Um, and, and, and look how it, you know, look how it affected them. All right, so, silver lining. O almost done, I see the food's starting to be passed out, so. <laughs> Uh, say no to FUD. So FUD is an acronym. It stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And that is something that the cybersecurity industry is full of, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You will get salespeople talking to you saying, you're going to be hacked unless you use this product, this tool, that sort of thing, right? Let's, let's, just, let's just get that out now, right? There are so many things that we can do that are inexpensive and that are relatively simple that can, get, that can make us not be that low-hanging fruit. Second is, is don't be scared of the cloud. So I, I was consulting in the Philippines probably eight or nine years ago now, and um, there was a school system there that I was working on setting up their computer network for. And the reason I was there is, so they had experienced a flood. Um, so all of their paper records were destroyed. Um, they, had, they had some 
records on their computers, but it was all local within the school. Well, after the flood, right, the computer systems that weren't destroyed were stolen, right? The building was unoccupied, right? There's all this, there's all this uh, hardware there that's free for the taking. So they, they lost literally everything, right? So when we hear about things like the cloud, um, it, uh, you know, our first thought might go, well, it's, it's going out of our control. It's, it's somewhere that, it's somewhere that you know, we can't control, we can't see it, we may not understand it. Um, but the technology is mature now that we can place sub-level of trust in it. Just like we trust, you know, for the most part, that our cars are gonna start in the morning. And then last thing, and uh, the next slide will have some of these, uh, resources are available. Uh, free or inexpensive resources are available. The internet, you know, Google, uh, Yahoo, the search engines are a thing now, right? Um, you, <laughs> you can actually use, uh, you know, something like ChatGPT. You can ask it questions and it can give you some really good cybersecurity advice sometimes. Um, now, th this is a long quote, and I'm not gonna, you know, read it out loud. But this, this kind of leads along the lines of something we heard earlier today, where um, the, digit the digitization of education uh, is, is such a, like a force multiplier for education, right? Um, if we look at things like the pandemic, the countries, the nations, the school systems that did not take advantage, that didn't already have um, you know, things like cloud-based or internet-based uh, learning systems, they fell behind because what other choice did they have? They didn't already have the infrastructure in place, right? So we'll go to the last slide here. I'll just leave this up for a moment. There's a, there's, <laughs> some of these are pretty long, right? But uh, if, if you just kind of keep the, uh, uh, the title on the left, right, Google can take you the rest of the way there. Uh, in terms of the data, uh, the data breaches on that and the Verizon data breach investigations report have a lot of data that you can filter out specifically from the education side, which is very useful. At the top there, K-12 Security Information Exchange, the Center for Internet Security, and the, uh, the US CISA, they all have free resources uh, to use for helping us both on a technical level, but also on an organization people process level uh, for protecting our data. And finally, at the bottom, a couple of links to some um, you know, privacy and, and uh, compliance-related uh, information. All right. Thank you. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm grateful for being given the opportunity to speak. And uh, I will no longer be standing between you and lunch. Yeah.